Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week, about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way. Writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Major Jackson, Lee Herrick, and Frank Bedard, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode will also be recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a reading by in conversation with Paul Muldoon, Paisley Rectal, and Shane McRae. I will return after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, I know many of you have discovered the chat to the right of your screen. That's where you can make comments, have ongoing dialogue there. But if you have a question, please look to the bottom of your screen and you'll see Ask a Question, and that's where I'll go right at the end of the session, the episode, to look for your questions to ask the authors. Three, there's also a buy author's books at Bird's Books. Don't forget that we're a bookstore. Please consider buying the, please support the work of these authors and our little bookstore with the purchase of a book. Now a little bit about our first speaker. Paul Muldoon was born in Northern Ireland in 1951. He now lives in New York. A former radio and television producer for the BBC in Belfast, he has taught at Princeton University for more than 30 years. He is the author of 14 collections of poetry, including Howdy Skelp, Due Out Tomorrow. Among his awards are the 1972 Eric Gregory Award, the 1980 Sir Jeffrey Faber Memorial Award, the 1994 T.S. Eliot Prize, the 1997 Irish Times Poetry Prize, the 2003 Pulitzer Prize, the 2003 Giffen, Griffin International Prize for Poetry, the 2004 American Ireland Fund Literary Award, the 2004 Shakespeare Prize, the 2006 European Prize for Poetry, the 2015 Pigot Poetry Prize, and the 2017 Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry, and the 2020 Michael Marks Award. He is a fellow of the Royal Society for Literature and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Paul is also the editor of this stunning book of Paul McCartney's called The Lyrics, which came out two weeks ago. So Paul's been very busy, and I will welcome to the screen Paul Muldoon. Thank you so much, and what a delight to be here. And what a delight to be here with two, two of my favorite poets. Um, I'm going to read three poems, I think, from this new book, Howdy Skelp. And uh, the first one is called The Bannisters, and it's a poem that began with a, a story I heard about uh, how in the First World War, uh, <clears throat> the um, bannisters were repurposed, particularly walnut banisters, some of the harder woods repurposed as rifle butts. And I began to think about the other repurposings of uh, the uh, various uh, aspects of our lives, particularly having to do with our, the houses we live in, the repurposing of various aspects of those houses for um, war. Um, so this poem is called The Bannisters. Our ornamental gates and railings that were melted down for rifle barrels have gained some sort of posthumous renown, 
by unambiguously drawing a line in the sand. The gates and railings are finally taking a firm stand and even more emphatically bringing things to a close. The exit wound is their approximation of a rose or a geranium under gauze on the windowsill. Gangrene, the green and gold of the first full-blown daffodil. Also rendered, so it would even more tellingly rend, was lead stripped from the gutters and flashing. For lead will bend along a spine as it did along a walnut ridge post. What was once an outer sanctum is now the innermost. Shouldered as rifle stocks after a mere three weeks of drill. The banisters are gradually taking another hill. So this next one is set in a um, square, <clears throat> a piazza, possibly in Italy, possibly a it's a square in France, somewhere somewhere in Europe, and. Um, it's um, a love poem, I suppose, and it has to do with um, a sheet that's being used to project a film. Um, many of you will have come across that. It's one of my favorite things. One rarely sees it these days, the sheet uh, set up in a, in a public place and then a film uh, projected on it. So that's, that's what's happening <coughs> here, the sheet. We were sitting in a village square, not so very much broader than the bridal suite that overlooked it. The suite where we'd spent at least part of that afternoon extending our modest repertoire of love forays and love feats. Now we had to, made, now we made do with playing footsie at a cafe table while pondering fettuccine with sage. Plein air or en plein air. You checked your iPhone, a culinary herb native to Southern Europe and the Mediterranean, once thought to grow best in households where the wife is dominant even though the supporting evidence was far from scant. This was a theory I must put to rest, given the frantic smoothing out of air by the man and two young boys hoisting a sheet through what was irreparably twilight. A grandfather and you surmised his two grandsons were about to run a test on the projector that had only recently become a prominent feature of our lives. It looked very much as if the eggplant was introduced to the West by Alexander the Great. As to whether normal wear and tear could have accounted for the rip in your Himalayan wrap itself, a shade of aubergine in a blend of wool and noir, the jury was still out. Acquainted though we'd been with the fact cellulose nitrate is notoriously unstable, we were nonetheless taken unawares when the reel of film began to disintegrate, even as images of what looked like some of our earlier exploits were thrown up on the screen. <clears throat> now then with a little poem, um, which I'll read on this occasion. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, 
for Shane McRae, who, who tells me he might like it. And uh, it's a poem called The Fly. So I'll read this and then I'll hand you over to Paisley, The Fly. Surrounded as he is by the blood spatter from the cut and thrust over an idea to which he was but briefly wed. The fly is washing his hands of the matter till the smoke clears. A wild catter on a rig still lumbering across the North Sea's bed, surrounded as he is by the blood spatter and spout of crude. He remembers only a scatter of crudite, heavy hors d'oeuvre, glasses, remembers seeing red. The fly is washing his hands of the matter. Now a meal in an upper room has once again served to shatter his illusions. Overcome by the high hum of the dead, surrounded as he is by the blood spatter from the cruets of oil and vinegar. The fly is tempted to spray attar of roses on the aforesaid fly washing his hands of the matter. If only because the internet chatter points to a city about to cede to the forces of Ethelred, surrounded as it is. By the blood spatter you shall know them, as you shall know a satyr by his horse's ears and tail. Instead of washing his hands of the matter, the fly might embrace an earth that is irredeemably in tatters, a banquet of slivers and shreds surrounded as it is by the interplanetary blood spatter, might heed the pitter-patter of unborn fly feet on the stair tread. But the fly is washing his hands of the matter, even as he contemplates a platter complete with its severed head, now the centerpiece of the spread surrounded as he is by the blood spatter the fly is washing his hands of the matter thank you paul our next speaker is paisley rectal as an American poet who is currently serving as Poet Laureate of Utah, she is the author of a book of essays entitled The Night My Mother Met Bruce Lee, Observations on Not Fitting In, a memoir intimate, as well as five books of poetry. For her work, she has received numerous fellowships, grants, awards, including not, and but not limited to the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, a Citavella Rainieri Residency and National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, Pushcart Prizes in both 2009 and 2013, Narratives Poetry Prize, the AWP Creative Nonfiction Prize, and several other awards from the State Arts Council. She's been recognized for her poems and essays in New York Times Magazine, American Poetry Review, the Kenyon Review, the New Republic, Tin House, the Best American Poetry Series, and on National Public Radio. Among others, she is also a recipient of a 2019 Academy of Ameri American Poets Laureate Fellowship. This is the book that we're highlighting this evening. Please welcome to the screen, Paisley Rectal. As soon as I can find her. There you are. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is a real honor to be reading with um, both Paul and Shane, whose work has deeply influenced mine for years. So um, I'm just going to read two poems. And interestingly, I'm also starting with a war poem. Actually, both my poems are war poems. This poem is also considering um, the ways in which many members of my family um, 
fought in different conflicts all the way up to Afghanistan and what that means. I'm half Chinese and it's interestingly the, the Chinese side of my family that's been part of the various war effort, efforts. So this is a brand new poem and it's called tentatively watching Kabul on the news falling. I thought as I shouldn't of my mother 20 years earlier on the phone saying the towers had fallen saying planes had struck the Pentagon where my cousin John worked, the naval section no one could get through to, cell phone towers jammed, traffic stopped. It would take a day to learn he'd been at Langley getting promoted to captain, a step away from Rear Admiral, the first Chinese American to graduate in the top 10 of his class at the Naval Academy another 20 years before. I attended his graduation as a child, propped between my Chinese uncle who'd fought in Vietnam and my white father who volunteered before he got drafted. My uncle got the Purple Heart and Bronze Star for service he has never spoken of, honors only my father has confirmed, my uncle too embarrassed to ever bring it up for who is praise for but those who fear being invisible. I wanted to love my country the way I love my uncle, which is to say I wanted a story in which I saw some better part of ourselves reflected, not split along some dark line the past would demarcate for us, the family we were before we were, ima we were imagined as American, the family we'd become after, even if most of us were, at the root of paper, always American. Perhaps even we feared we still belonged to some nation we reviled others for consigning us to, as if we believed we had no future here, no hopes our lives would one day be individuated by desire alone, that we could live only for ourselves, which is not the truth. No one lives only for themselves, not my father, not my uncle. Their lives belong, like all lives, to history. And if my father is drunk now almost all the time, it is not just because of war, the past's recurrent violences. The towers fell, my father drank and watched TV and drank some more. He shut himself away in a prison of screens with no locks, no doors, only a bright glass box bathed each day with a liquid that in certain lights must look like blood. Oh, this is not the country I wanted to live in, but it is the country I've had to adopt. My cousin did not die that day in the rubble of the Pentagon, but attended more than 40 funerals for friends. Straight laced, bright, the smartest of us all, my parents said, and because he was born first a boy revered by our grandparents. He was the promise of America for those of us whose first language was not English, but who had made, finally, a most American son. It took two generations to achieve it, a smattering of stars, the crisp white lines of a uniform worn on the warship he commanded that launched the first airstrikes on Baghdad. Tracers of green on black blurring the screen, I watched with roommates screaming in the dark at the television. I didn't know that he was there. He wouldn't have cared that I had watched. Now we live a country length apart and never ask each other how we vote. He is the kindest one in all my family, the most honorable, most loyal son, and he is another of us who's killed. I would love to say he disagreed with all of it, that a job forced him to express not his own power, but someone else's, though, at what point is expressing another's force just the act of taking up one's own? I don't know what my uncle thought, faced with an enemy that looked so like him. Did it make some salient difference to point to another and see his own face look back? Did my cousin's place on that stage ennoble him, or was his presence sought to ennoble the stage, one singular advancement meant to excuse or redeem a worse one? This is the truth of our meaning in America. Each of us become the achievement of a dream that's curdled into nightmare. Even my father is ashamed of it, ashamed of us. It's Saigon again all over. He slurs at me on the phone. But how he stood beside my un uncle that day and clapped as my cousin crossed the stage. 
Look at that Oriental parading himself up there. He never heard the man behind me say, while my aunts and grandparents stood and cheered. Our happiness, such as it is, has come at such a cost. When I stood watching the television this morning, I thought again of my mother's panic that stage, the flares, the sound of one glass raised to touch another, breaking. Of course, I told my mother on the phone, I'll find John's number, but the line was dead. I held it anyway. I pressed it to my ear. And the second poem I'll read, and the final one, uh, comes out of a time I spent in Vietnam. I was living there for a while in Hanoi, and I lived right next door to um, the Vietnam Military History Museum. And with it, if anyone's ever been there, it has the most amazing sculpture that is actually made of uh, actual war wreckage, which I describe here. Assemblage of Ruined Plane Parts, Vietnam Military Museum, Hanoi. My eye climbs a row of spoilers soldered into ailerons, cracked bay doors haphazarded into windows where every rivet bleeds contrails of rust. An hour ago, the doctor's wand waved across my chest and I watched blood on a small screen get back sucked into my weakened heart. It's grown a hole I have to monitor, one torn flap shuddering in infinite ellipses of gray stars back and forth. You're the writer, the doctor said in French. Tell me what you see. Easier to stand in a courtyard full of tourists scrying shapes from this titanic Rorschach. Here's a pump stub shaped like a hand, something celled, cavernously fluted as a lobster's abdomen. How much work it must have taken to drag these bits out of pits of flame from lake beds and rice paddies and stuck them in layers, the French plains heaped beneath the American ones, while the Englishwoman beside me peers into this mess of metals, trying to isolate one image from the rest. Ski boot buckle or tire bump, she muses, fossilized shark's jaw, clothespin, wasp's nest. According to her camera, it's just a picture changing with each angle, relic turned to rib cage, chrome flesh to animal, all the mortal details enumerated, neutered. I watch her trace an aluminum sheet torched across a thruster as if wind had tossed a silk scarf over a face. If she pulled it back, would I find a body foreign as my own entombed in here, a thousand dog tags jangling the dark? I tilt my head. The vision slides once more past me, each plane reassembling, then breaking apart. Spikes of grief, or is it fury, throb across the surface. Everything has a rip in it, a hole, a tear, the dim sounds of something struggling to pry open death's cracked fuselage. White sparks, iron trails, my heart rustles in its manila folder. How the doctor smiled at the images I fed him. A row of trees, I said, pointing at my chart. Stone towers, a flock of backlit swallows. Now I kneel beside a cross of blades on which the Englishwoman tries to focus. Do you think I'll get it all in the shot, she calls as she steps back, steps back and back. Something like a knife sheath, something like a saint's skull. The sky floats past, horizon sucked into it. She won't. Thank you. Thank you, Paisley. Let me. Shane McRae is our next speaker. He is an American poet and is currently poetry editor of Image. McRae was the recipient of a 2011 Whiting Award and a 2012 his collection Mule was the finalist for the Kate Tufts Discovery Award and a Penn Center USA Literary Award. In 2013, McRae received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. He received a L Lannan Literary Award in 2017. And in 2018, his collection In the Language of My Captor won an Anisfeld Wolf Book Award. And in 2019, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. His poems have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Best American Poetry, American Poetry Review, African American Review, Fence, and Agni. This is his latest book. Please welcome to the screen, Shane McRae.
Thank you, Shane. <laughs> Thank you, Alice, for that introduction. Um, I am uh, so excited uh, to uh, read with Paul and Paisley. Um, their readings uh, will were uh, wonderful, and I'm uh, just going to try not to let the side down. Um, I uh, am going to read uh, three poems. Um, this first one is um, a kind of poem one is repeatedly sort of warned not to write. It is one uh, about Greek mythology. Um, some of this uh, features characters that you know, but some of it, well, one character, Penelope, wife of Odysseus, but uh, the details I have made up. And it is called Penelope and the Watching Fire. She burned the loom each night for heat, but each morning it returned whole and draped with a restless blue fabric, a waves skeleton. The first few mornings it appeared, she was surprised by the wave. She had publicly vowed she would not lay eyes upon the sea until her husband, who even as she spoke her vow, perhaps lay drowned in the sea, returned. And soon she came to believe the wave was sent to her by the god of waves to torment her. One of her suitors, an attractive man, but too young, had told her as her husband's slaves cleared breakfast from the room of the blinding of the Cyclops by no man, who she was sure was her husband. Perhaps the bones with which she wove were his. Perhaps she would not see him again, but instead would labor always, her fingers bloodying the blue threads at the machine of her husband's bones. And so she thought of him, long years into his absence, as his slaves stuffed the loom, its hollow parts, the gaps in its workings, with straw, as she watched them bend, who could not choose how to use their strength. This uh, is the moon is drifting away from the earth at a rate of four centimeters per year, which it is. But five billion years from now, the moon will stop. Its orbit will have gotten as big as it's going to get. A 47 day lunar month, one day, you won't feel it. The moon will stop. The moon will snap into place one day and drift no farther from us away, the earth, us. And the moon won't anymore affect the tides. The sun will move the oceans and the moon will only watch its face lit by the sun, the ocean swaying. Except the sun by then, by 50 billion years, just 5 billion years from now, the sun will have swollen and consumed the earth and moon, 5 billion more or less, or changed in such a way the drifting of the moon away to all the way away won't happen, or the oceans will be stripped from the face of the earth. Where are you going? Do you think you're going? It has been theorized the moon was struck from the earth was torn from the earth, was struck away, and that was how the moon was made. All its existence has been one explosion, and every poem one report was struck away. Even now you see the moon recoils from violence at the source of which you stand. In the pursuing darkness in a forest far from the city, you have come back home, elated at first, driving, and the distance seemed as you passed beneath the traffic lights at what had been the first real intersection. You recognized it, but the wasteland where the wasteland used to be, the last quick mile before the intersection, green but ragged, but green and ragged, now was shops and one gas station where you used to wish a gas station would be when you were 17. But seeing it as you approached the first real intersection, what had been the first, but now it was the third or fourth, you lost your sense of where you were. But even so, elated, though the distance seemed, the distance from the city to your hometown seemed so short it passed so quickly you, arriving, wondered whether you had ever gotten all the way away, though everything had changed, the town had changed, and now was unfamiliar. And if you hadn't gotten all the way away, where have you been? Because if so, you haven't all those years since college been in the city. Where, but where have you ever lived where you felt your body altogether was yours? 
separate from the place where you were living, or not yours, but a part of the place, if ever either, not either, since you were a child. You've always been a moon of where you've lived. And after, right away, after you passed through the once first, now third, fourth intersection, a panic overcame you and you swerved. A panic overcame you and you tried to turn around. You jerked the wheel to the left and swerved. What will the city be when you return if, leaving, you have brushed away the cataract of its familiar changes? You needed to get back and almost swerved into a long blue car the color of a cloudless sky at noon in early spring. Tail fins, four headlights, wide, older than you, alien. And you swerved, and the long car swerved, though its driver didn't turn his head till hours later, night, when he was sitting, he's 16 and he's sitting, at a bright window in a bright house, at the edge of the dark forest. The full moon clarifies the bare branches through which you see the house, how bright the window is, how bright it is, how bright. This is the last poem I'm going to read. Um, it might be useful to know that uh, when I was three years old, I was kidnapped uh, by my maternal grandparents who were white supremacists and didn't want me to see my father who was black. Uh, and I didn't see him again for uh, 13 years. This is called The Loneliness of the Kidnapped Child. To the beach at where, oh, I should say, sorry, I don't know if I said, this is my last poem. To the beach at where, at anywhere a beach is, but might have been in Oregon, unless my grandparents weren't yet showing me in public, unless they were afraid I would remember they had kidnapped me and say so to a stranger, so and so and so, and at whom and for how long then would they have to smile to get free? How whitely nod and wriggle for a security guard, poor, how far beneath them the last smile on earth or to the beach of the Gulf of Mexico, some several fewer thousand miles from Austin, and where the water looked unnatural colored to me who hadn't then before seen water not bound on all sides, penned, caught, and blue, kept clean, the influx there prevented of influence from other waters, said to, but said by whom who weren't themselves corrupted, said to be water just the same as that which even I, a child, could see looked cleaner and was blue. To the beach at the Gulf of Mexico, I was four, was five, was six, that child a hallucination now. My mother's parents, it was summer, took me there. And almost none of it, most of it gone now. I remember almost none of it, not even myself, a dream now. I remember except the crying seagulls at the window of the hotel room in which we stayed, from which I don't remember leaving once, except to go back home. The crying seagulls crying at our window at no other crying until I threw them bread. My mother's mother had packed a loaf of bread. I tore the loaf apart as fast as I could tear it, each brown slice apart, and threw the pieces to the seagulls. Who was standing next to me? Which kidnapper, smiling a hallucination, helping with the loaf, but will not let me leave the room, not even leave with them, not hand in hand with them, down to the water to watch the seagulls there that wouldn't cry so hungrily there, and some would hover quiet above the waves, and some would settle on the waves, and none would know my face. Thank you. Great poem, Shane. Can, can you hear me? Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and you know, compared to uh, your life, I, I feel that I've lived. 
I've barely lived at all and that I've lived a rather dreary, a rather kind of boring middle life <laughs> compared to some of the things that you've been through. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I mean, I was wondering actually, I mean, I, of course I know this poem, but as you, when you said earlier, it might be useful if one knew this. I mean, is there enough evidence of the background as it were in that poem? I know I'm leading, leading this is a kind of a, a big question, but is there enough info in the poem itself to, to give you the, to give you that? I have a feeling there is, but what do you think yourself? Um, I, you know, I think that there is, it's, it's, you know, almost more like, it feels like something I ought to say so that people are properly adjusted. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm 46 years old and I realized it was last year, um, that, um, like on my entire childhood, I was a kidnapped child. I never really thought about it, even though I was in the middle of it. Um, and I think that that's because it feels like something of, it feels a bit absurd and it feels like something that doesn't happen to anybody you ever see or know. And so, um, even when I was in the midst of it, I didn't think of myself as being in the midst of it. And so it feels like the sort of thing that you should say, um, or I should say before I read the poem, just so that people, um, sort of feel themselves positioned in a way for it to make sense. Well, I think also, you know, when one if, when one is reading the poem, one can always reread it. One can go back and take another uh, trawl trawl through it. Whereas I think in this very strange contract that we have here with our audience at the moment, um, there really isn't an opportunity to do that. So I think probably in, in all cases, the more info one has, um, you know, by way of setting up the poem, probably the better. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I know, I know, I at least can't um, follow poetry readings. <laughs> I, 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 I definitely enjoy doing them, but I have I generally no idea what's going on. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I, I like being there, but it is hard to know what is happening. So I think that the more context you can give, um, the more uh, useful, um, or, uh, you know, the, the better the experience, or at least I hope so. Mm -hmm. Basically, I thought that poem you read about your family was just heartbreaking, really. <clears throat> you know? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's one of those things. Um, you know, I decided, and that was interestingly talking about trying to set, set stuff up, um, trying to explain all mm -hmm. the different wars my family had been. I didn't, you know, I didn't even mention Korea. <laughs> Um, but to think about that was, I mean, I, I, I'm not being very articulate now, mostly because I'm still sort of, I've been working on these essays about poetry and war and what we think we are doing when we write poems about war. And I had to sort of sit down and ask myself, well, why am I interested in this? And it really did strike me as um, somebody who teaches in an academic institution. Most of my colleagues don't actually have military family. Um, and I wouldn't claim to have like very, you know, deep connections to the military myself, but it really just thinking about my family's history with war made me realize just like how much American history was sort of woven into our story and it's woven into everyone's story, but in ways that um, were kind of unpleasant to think about. I mean, oftentimes with, you know, in, within Asian America, I think we like to talk about ourselves as, as trying to become a seen as real Americans, but there's a real cost to being seen as a real American if you're part of the military, I think, um, you know, and, and what you represent and, and, and the values that you represent that you may not necessarily agree with, especially when, you know, you're also fighting against people who look like you or who, who are, in terms of their political and, and ethnic affiliation, get affiliated with you in America, too. So I, th I think that's kind of a something I'm still wrestling with. Yeah, uh, Paul, I wondered if you saw that there was a question yeah. uh, for you in the chat. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't notice that. I'm not good at this and I'm useless <laughs> at questions. And as for answers, I'm really bad at those. But what is what is the question? I don't see it. It says uh, it says I would love to know what or whom 
the fly represents. Very intriguing poem. Thank you, Paul. Yes, well, thank you so much for the question. Um, <clears throat> I'm tempted to say something kind of smart ass, and I think I'll say it anyway, which is that the fly represents itself or himself. Um, um, you know, one of the difficulties I think we have with reading poetry, many of us, is that we've, we have persuaded ourselves or we have been persuaded that a poem is never about what it seems to be about and certainly never about what it says it's about. Right? It's always encoded in some way. It always means something other than what it says. And generations of teachers, and I think we're, as the three of us are teachers, so you know, we're very mindful of that responsibility. Generations of teachers have been telling students that without a teacher, without a scout, one could never possibly enter, I think of it as entering the territory of the poem without a really seasoned scout who will get one through it. Yeah. And otherwise one will be, um, one will be um, you know, in terrible trouble. So in that sense, I try to, th in general, to think of the poem as, um, as, as, as not needing to be decoded, not needing to be translated. However, I think it's, it's a very fair question in that the fly does seem to have several guises. One of them um, is, I think, is that he, he might stand in as he washes his hands of the matter. Um, he might stand in for those of us who really turn a blind eye, uh, as you know, the, the, the central allusion there is to uh, that moment in uh, the Christian tradition, or at least the, the New Testament, where <clears throat> Pontius Pilate washes his hands of the responsibility of, uh, you know, of sending Christ down or up. And uh, so, I suppose it has to do with the, the not quite not taking responsibility for um, some of what um, assails us. Now, one matter that assails us, and I think I, th I need to look at the poem again to tell you the truth. But I, I, uh, I think one aspect of it there has to do with our uh, taking a less than dedicated view of the, of the gravity of the climate um, you know, crisis, right? Um, but there are many other crises in which uh, I think we, we could probably all do better uh, in, in trying to you know, take seriously some of the, um, the issues that face us societally. But I, so I'd say that. And then I'll go back and say, the fly is looking after himself. Mm. He's standing in for himself. I'm so you can see I'm sort of vacillating there a little bit. And I, as I warned you, the question, the answer is, 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 is a problem. One of the things, I think I'm just going to ask this into the ether now. One of the things that really interested me about both uh, the fly and the banister was that in some ways, these are two natural or domestic elements that take part in or observe tragedy, like really, you know, kind of ghastly tragedy. And I'm curious yeah. if um, they, to take that that perspective is really an interesting one. And I was wondering how um, how conscious you were of of making that decision, or was that just an automatic decision for you? Well, frankly, um, I, I, the poems I write are, and I'm sure this is true of you, both of you, it, it was true of me, I'll speak for myself for the moment and then turn it back to you, but I, I basically never have any idea really of what I'm doing when I'm writing a poem. So I, I, I don't ever sit down, well, I rarely, I rarely, rarely, rarely sit down to write a poem about something. In fact, we might as well say I never do that. Mm -hmm. 
I always find out what it's quote unquote about, if indeed it's about anything, um, through the process of writing it. Mm. So that, that that's the discovery is is so I can see um I can see that stepping outside the poem, um, as you're able to do, um that that you know that th those would be very um, very reasonable comments. I mean, one does try oneself to step outside the poem, but it's hard, of course. Yeah. It's part of the requirement. It's part of the job of being a writer is to be able to step out and treat with a certain amount of um, circumspection, uh, you know, what what is being produced. But the fact remains that it's coming really mostly from one's unconscious mm. and um, well, the conscious mind um, is in my opinion is equipped to deal with the unconscious only up to a point you know yeah. and certainly over the years um, you know people have pointed out things about my poems that I would never have, would never have occurred to me and uh, despite you know the extent to which one tries to be conscious of what might be going on i'm sorry i'm rambling here i felt that way with your poem shane the one about the moon which is so beautiful like you get that factoid and then it just starts to spin and then it just you could feel the poem just kind of opening and opening and opening and i really enjoyed that that's oh, more of a question <laughs> just, no that's a fine question but yeah i mean i think that um in some ways the way it, 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 it it's working if it's working is um a consequence of um maybe trying to fork foreground the process of um the poem discovering itself as it goes along um i don't know how many times i've read it i mean you know i don't ever read my poems for fun but i've read it because um revising it for various reasons and i suddenly just this time well, i wrote the poem maybe a year ago or so uh reading it notice a detail that connects um the subject of the poem the person and the moon sort of explicitly that i had never noticed before and so i was surprised by that and you know but I guess that's testimony to how little uh, I know about it. What was that? What was that detail? What was that detail? Um, what was that detail? Um, all right, hold on. Let me let me let me uh, let, let me hop back and see if it's gonna uh -huh. jump out in front of me immediately. Um, uh, I think it was uh, to do. So there's this line where uh, I'm talking about how the moon um, is, you know, it's drifting away from. Uh, the earth but it will never get you know all the way away and then i use that same mm -hmm. phrase all the way away to talk about uh the person who has left their hometown and is maybe worried that they've not gotten okay. all the way away it seems like right. an obvious thing but i never saw that yes um paisley there is a question for you in the chat too really? and it says for I paisley <laughs> um i am also someone who is half asian and half white and enjoys writing as a hobby uh, do you ever find it hard talking about your identity in your writing? Whenever I try to explore these things, it feels cliche or somehow overdone. I feel like my story has been told as a mixed race woman growing up in America, yet I still feel compelled to write. Um, wow, that's a uh, that's a great question. Um, and you know, it did. It was hard for me to talk about my identity my writing when I first started out as a poet, which is one of the reasons I turned to nonfiction, actually. And um, then, as I got sort of more comfortable with what poetry is and can do, and all the different kinds of modes that I can work in, I found that that enters in in surprising ways, in different ways. I don't necessarily address it always in an obvious or conscious way. I think there's um, some aspects of my writing in terms of its formalism that I would say <clears throat> actually reflects maybe some of that biracial experience um, that I don't know if other people would see. And I kind of don't mind. I don't really care if people see it or don't see it. Um, but, you know, I, I think just because someone else has written about being raced, growing, mixed race growing up in America doesn't mean that they've actually told your story. Uh, I, I, everyone right. has a very different experience of that geography, history, class, education, language, all of these play, you know, tremendous, you know, role in one's identity. And so just, you know, just being mixed race can't be treated as a singular condition, really. I mean, I think there are certain things that people share in common who are mixed race. I'm sure Shane and I would have some interesting conversations, but obviously knowing Shane's work, our backgrounds are 
and our experiences are wildly different in so many other ways. So we could, you know, um, I would, I would encourage you to continue to write um, and to continue to explore these things because you don't know, you don't know what you know until you've written it. And I think that's the thing that's, um, I sort of, I think I'm echoing something that Paul was getting at and Shane was getting at too, which is that you don't, when you launch into something that you're writing, the best writing is when you don't know where you're going and it surprises you into certain types of insights that you didn't know you had. Um, and that's that's the real gift of it. So you don't really, even though other people have written about this experience, like I said, they don't have your insights and they'll, they'll never have those. Um, that's just, right. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's, sorry, Shan, go ahead. No, 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 Paul, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say that to that last questioner there, the, the, the last correspondent, that, you know, it's the, the, the it's not as if the ground is is ever covered, you know. One, I mean, if if we if any of us felt that the ground had been covered, uh, we we'd probably we we just all go home and get in bed and never come out. Um, you have to believe that there's something there's something uh, there's still something to be done, you know, from whatever background one might be coming, you know. Um, uh, as an That's me. Sorry. <laughs> As an Irish person, for example, I mean, there have been enough Irish people writing about this, that, and the other to make one feel one definitely shouldn't raise one's little head. But that's not what it's about, yeah. because each new poem is is about itself. Uh, at the risk of sounding tedious about that, it's a new experience, and uh, so you just go for it and, and don't worry about other people. I agree. I mean, I think of all the people who've written about love and we're still doing it. <laughs> we're all still doing it. Shane, I'd like to thank you for taking my job and asking the questions. <laughs> sure. I do have others. Um, do you mind my butting in now or are you all, or did you finish sure, your thread? Um, there's a question that Roger asked in one of the former episodes. So I like to bring it up at every episode just to hear what the answer might be uh what are the grounds where poetry and prose meet you can pass on it this is not homework well i mean poetry <laughs> there's a great tradition of the uh of the prose poem, uh, for example, and you know, that would be, a, when we say the grounds, do we mean the area in which they meet? <laughs> That'd be the garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, I would say, I would say, what, what about the African veldt? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, two, they're two quite, they're two very similar gray areas, right? I sometimes think of them uh, think of them in this in the when I'm forced to think about it, <laughs> um, and it's, I think about it only when I'm forced to think about it. Um, I think of them as being two, you know, grey areas, a bit like a rhino and a hippo, <laughs> and it's what it, it's it's always clear. Which, it's a bit hard to say which is which, but no that's, one's chasing but you. It's always clear <laughs> when one is charging you what it is right and one of the defining characteristics of verse and we is the word we should probably be using um of what we usually refer to as poetry is that it does it's the stuff that doesn't quite reach the right hand margin right so that's a handy way in general that's a handy way of, of telling them apart but it would be um it would be um it would be a, a Fool, I think, who would try to hold forth on the the differences between them, and because the minute one points to it, yeah. an example of where they come together comes in, and uh, anyway, but it is it is it is a topic for endless uh, mirth, I'm sure. I, you know, I I just think one of the reasons it's so difficult to pull them apart, and also it's easy to see where they collapse together is that our earliest non-fictional forms are actually written in verse. You know, when we think of, you know, <laughs> on the nature of things or work, you know, when we think of um, Alexander Pope essay on man and stuff like that, you know, they're all 
these are things that have very heavy prose qualities to them or what we now associate because of genre restrictions prose you know prose uh aspects to them but of course they were written in verse because that was that was the mode that was that was the form everyone was writing everything in it seemed like you know and i i guess the only thing that i would say about poetry that makes it sort of obviously different is it's it's um it's love of pattern that poetry maybe more than any other genre loves pattern whether that's through repetition of phrases um motifs sounds you know individually i mean of course you can see that all over good prose as well but there's something about poets the yeah. obsessiveness around pattern that 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 sort of just makes that exponentially worse for us <laughs> i don't know worse or better Shane, Shane, do you have anything to add to that uh you know um not really um it's okay. Uh, <laughs> prose um, has uh, prose sort of filled me with anxiety for whatever reason for for many years, and so I kind of um, I kind of didn't think about it a whole lot. I mean, I think um, I think the ground. I mean, it's I, I suppose it I suppose it's going to sound a little trite, but the ground um, for me uh, where they meet is really more like a ground where they you know each stand up one end of a field and, and and sort of stare at the other one and that would be sort of language um i think that you know um they're both working with the same thing but the to my mind at least they're working with the same thing um in very different ways um and i think um because of the often enough severity of the difference um there's a degree of uh they look at each other with uh each with a degree of suspicion um and so i think that uh the ground on which they meet is also uh the ground on which they are estranged and that they are always both meeting and being estranged and that's part i mean sort of that's the engine that drives the relationship mm, i like that that's really nice i do too thank you all right, folks, I have one last question, and I'm a bookseller, so I've got to know, what book are you currently reading, book or books? <laughs> Ladies first. I see you disappear to get a cover. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm one of those people that just reads um, four books at the same time. So um, I'm reading Lightning Falls in Love by Lorca Shishki. Um, I just got this mm. read by Polina Barskova. Um, by translated by Valjana. Oh, I just butchered her name. I apologize, but this is really interesting too. Um, yeah, so I just saw her the other day. She's brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah and she's then brilliant. This book, um, Cultural History, by Dan Adler. He basically dissects this um, work of art by Hannah Darbovan. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing her name right. And then this book of poetry, The Silence That Remains, um, a translation yes. of. Yeah, this is a wonderful book. I really yes. enjoyed it a lot. So I just finished it yesterday at a cafe. So these are the four that I'm reading. Or read. Gentlemen, who's next? Well, I, I'll go. These are these are books that I um, that are at the top of my rather deep pile, and uh, <laughs> of books that I'm getting round to reading. So that I'm just about to start. This is uh, Nine Nasty Words by John McWhorter. Oh, I wanted to get that. Very yeah. interesting. Uh, Can you hold up writer. the cover, Paul? I can't see yeah, it. Certainly may at the, yes, now, some versions of some of those words appear there. So, you know, is it nine o'clock yet? Not quite. Thank you. Yeah, John McWhorter. And, for, you know, this is a book that was, um, I was talking to a tap, tap dancer friend the other day. And uh, he, he recommended this book, which I promptly went out and uh, bought. It's called Ring Shout Wheel About, The Racial mm -hmm. Politics of Music and Dance in North American Slavery. Oh, uh, so this is really interesting. What wow. looks like a really interesting. What do you, yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. I hadn't heard it, as I say. And so this is what my wife calls a Paul book. Uh, it's called The Dawn of Everything, 
A New History of Humanity. That is by David Graeber and uh, David uh, Wen Wengrow, I assume it's pronounced. Have you got it in your store? We have it in our store, and from all the reports from the publisher, is becoming a sleeper hit because they're starting to run out of it. And it just came out. It's it's an astonishing book. It's for people that like sapiens. Yeah, it's, I'm yeah. one of those. Yep. Uh, I also like, uh, oh, I, I don't know how many books about Neanderthals I have. I must have half a dozen. And uh, so I, I, I'm, this is my, my kind of book. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Shane, what are you reading these days? Well, I, 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 you know, I did not, I don't have covers to show. I don't know why I didn't, it, that didn't occur to me. Um, well, we I, talked about I, it in the green room, so you're, you're, lo you're off the hook. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, um, just finished, um, it's not out in the U S yet, but it's about to, uh, arrive. Joe Mashinska's, um, making darkness light, which is kind of a biography of Milton, kind mm -hmm. of a biography of the author's mm -hmm. relationship with Milton. Oh. Um, I just finished Paul's new book, um, which, uh, was wonderful. Uh, Howdy Scalp. I'm in the. I'm on the volume. Thank you four. so much. It was fantastic. I'm on volume four of Peter Ackroyd's six volume history of England. Um, oh, just yeah. sort of reading all those back to back. He's a great writer. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm. I, I'm loving it. Um, I, I, I'm really enjoying that book. I'm reading. Um, I'm still in the middle of. Um, David Constantine's biography of Hulderlin, as well as his translations of Hulderlin. Um, I'm rereading um, all of Milton just because. Um, and really? And sure. why? Uh, wow. He's, he's really good. Um, no, I'm just, <laughs> wow. I, 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 you know, I, I enjoy it. Um, and um, I mean, there's a, there's some, there's some other ones. Um, I, uh, Sylvia Legree's, uh, her new book, um, I'm reading that too, although for some reason the title is escaping me and I don't know why I just picked it up. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm reading, I'm reading a few books too. So it sounds like you read a lot of different things at the same time. A lot yes. of people do. Some people can only read one at a time. Other people just plow through. <laughs> Folks, this has been a wonderful evening and I want to thank each of you for sharing your work and sharing your thoughts. Uh, I am going to say good night and sign off, each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye, Thanks. guys. Bye. I'd like to thank Paul, Paisley, and Shane for participating in Write America this evening to everyone who tuned in tonight. And a special thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating a very special series to look forward to each Monday evening. Please remember we have the author's books I, and many, all three of these have signed book plates that we've put in the books. So it's a special opportunity to get a signature in a book. I hope to see you next Monday evening when we hear from Russell Banks and Ishmael Angeluk Hope. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been a great evening and uh, stay well. Thank you. <laughs>